this time we will focus on the how to write uh, and uh, how to uh, make count, send up count in Google Scholar Citation and uh, uh, Org ID. And the second part will be in we will introduce how to use R markdown. So, so when you try to uh, uh, search CV in Google Scholar, uh, in Google uh, Browser, you will see a resume also there. So what's the difference between resume and the CV? Uh, resume is uh, when compare that based on three uh, points. So for the length, resume will uh, relative uh, short, shorter than CV, and for content, the resume uh, always includes all the uh, experience, annotations, summary of skills all of your uh, contributions uh, in the previous. And however, the content for the cur curriculum with Vita is uh, more specific. So it's usually uh, uh, error specific listing of education and academic background. <coughs> and also, we we'll see the different uh, focus uh, cause a different purpose of the CV and resume. Uh, the purpose for the program is you to get an interview or employment and the CV is for the application for more like academic positions such as uh, uh, apply for tenure and uh, apply for uh, grant and also some other academic uh, awards. So CV is a abbreviation of uh, Curriculum Vitae. It's a, a Latin origin. It means the, the course of one's life. And so, why, why do we want to talk about the CV in our detail? Really, that uh, time <coughs> is going fast uh, and quickly. So, if you're trying to plan to write a, a CV, it will help you to organize important things for your future career. And it assist in setting goals for your future. Uh, it, uh, it is needed when you like get your recommendation letter from professors or uh, you want to apply an academic position. And it is also required for some grants and award applications. So for the general uh, CV uh, writing, there are several suggestions here. It's, you always want to use same fonts throughout all this uh, CV. And the font size here should be 12 points. Uh, when you print it, it's just a regular paper. And uh, no underlining in your CV and a single setting. Also, use body and text to have things stand out, uh, number of pages, uh, don't put uh, graphics, and make sure your phone name is on every page. So, back tips for CV is that you should make clear like your uh, CV should be well organized and logical. It's like you, uh, for next slide I'll tell you, when you list some things, list your uh, uh, achievements, you should always list them from the current time to the past time. And you should make uh, your uh, uh, description of your achievements should be concise, like when do you get your degrees, uh, uh, what kind of research you have doing now and uh, it, should, it also should be complete like including you want uh, you need it for uh, the full uh, presentation to the HR uh, no, not HR for the uh, uh, position uh, who charge how who charge to hear the, the people for the position and you it also be consistent like no mixed in our fun, our funds and uh, make sure all your content including your CV is up So usually there are uh, uh, six parts. Uh, if you always want to firstly start with contact information, which has your phone name, money to mailing uh, address, email address, make sure email address you is that the one you check frequently, and uh, your phone number. Education is uh, your you already start from your undergraduate, graduate, post grad, and uh, there is honors and award. Uh, professional experience, professional experience always related to your 
uh, previous employment. And then it uh, more important ways because this C is always for academic positions. So uh, always put your publications and the presentations you have uh, done in the past. And in the end, you may ask, uh, add extra uh, curricular and volunteer experience so that make your uh, make uh, or continue need in the system. So uh, for the education section, you want to add most recent schooling first, uh, only include a diploma distinctions. And you want to make sure you, uh, you type in your school name correctly and uh, list your, uh, for each degree, list your thesis or dissertation titles. And the third part will be the honors and war section. Uh, remember always the list of all the uh, staffs, most recent and first. And uh, add honors and awards title, then specific date. You want to go back to undergraduate, but not before undergraduate. And only stuff related to academic or professional or content should be included. And you can also write in write scholarship you got it in the past. So for the fourth part your is a professional experiment section. You want to include anything you were paid in the past and uh, or both extensive and regular volunteer work. And only remember, CV is always for academic uh, relation application. Only list items relevant to academic work. At least most recent person. And you want to we want to mention your research, it better include the lab name or uh, the Principal investigator. And uh, for a specific, uh, uh, for specific professional experience, uh, the affiliations uh, and activities is the two details you want to include in your CV. Uh, the, affiliate, the affiliations are always use uh, choose the most come first and include our date of affiliation. Uh, you can uh, write down your goals in that uh, research activity. And you also want to include the institute you, are, uh, oh, you got the sponsorship from and uh, include your specific work content. So the fifth part will be politicians and presentation sections. Uh, always remember that you list them most recently to uh, oh, there are two options for you when you list your publications. So one is just a list from most recent to undergrad. And now we that list by the different types of publications. And you want to always like when you uh, list your uh, papers, so always make your name Body, so that people know which position you are in for that paper. And uh, uh, you can also uh, include the, the submitted and pending publications or publications. And we also help because your work has been done just waiting for a new um, So some of practitioners um, may be large or small, but uh, always show the pertinent one included in your CV. And you can also have your copy of your public checks along with your uh, CVs if you think it's, it's important for your CV. And the last part will be the extra curricular and the volunteer sections. Uh, always remember, at least the most recent and you may have a lot of uh, extra uh, curricular and volunteer activities, but it's better to have long-term and uh, some uh, you 
new HRS um, student organizations, that's where it should be created. And so, the, besides the six uh, section we mentioned before, you can add some uh, some qualifications you would like to add. Right? You can include uh, language uh, fluency and anything else special relative to the academic position. That's all for the presentation. Then I would like to introduce uh, uh, a lab head template. show what the real series looks like. Uh, so always at least uh, put your full name here and your uh, contact details. And so when you want to uh, write CV with that tag, the very useful command here is the uh, backslash each field. Backset each field is uh, a command that uh, creates a rubber like lines. So, like, uh, for example, oh, this, uh, this line, if you want to change your name, but your name or some other content, the lens will, <laughs> maybe there are some, uh, if you input more letters, it will go next lens. But the H fields will help you to keep that uh, line as um, something like, like as a rubber, looks like rubber stuff, you always make that line shrink or stretch based on the content. And we'll save you a lot, a lot of time if you, if you use Word to create, you will need a long time to change the styles to make it look nice. And another uh, another point in that you can see here is a website you can add URL. If you submit your CV as a PDF version, that if you uh, use that URL here, use that command, you can uh, you compile it to PDF, open the PDF, just click that uh, website, and you go to the website to get your uh, application set. Basically, this CV is just show structure. We just mentioned like the contact information, the education history, awards and fellowships here, and the professional experience, the technical skills you want to include related to the academic position. Research project you are involved, publications, and reference. Mm. So you can try, after the presentation, you can try to input your information on the left it's just to replace the uh, specific content, and then just you can see the, the basic structure of your CV. And you can check in. Periodically, so that you make sure your plan is there and you can fill fill up that CV as you want. Mm -hmm. That's basically on my part. Mm -hmm. okay. And all I've already uploaded that uh, template in our GCAM folder in Google Drive. Oh, yeah. But is there no page limit at all? And for resume, it's supposed to be one or two pages, right? Yes. And is there no page limit for CV? Yeah, usually you make it as long as it be. Because for resume, uh, they will just uh, look at like seven seconds. You want to make it short enough. Yeah. But for the CV, you want to show it's for academic position. You want to show you have enough academic experience. Okay. And you, can, you would like to include uh, all the Yeah, so a resume for a young person would be a single page, 
but for someone who has like a master's or anything like that, it would be it can be two pages, but everything should fit on two pages. For a CV, for someone in academia, it can just go on as long as necessary. But still, usually all the general stuff is packed into the first two pages, and then the rest is all long lists of papers and all that kind of stuff. So I think my CV is 58 pages long. Yes. If you want to read something that's boring, right? But the uh, but then also even if you're not in an academic position, it can be quite useful to have a two-page resume and then keep a second document of like lists of publications and activities, all that detailed stuff, so you keep track of it. HDMI cable over here. HDMI or VGA, they should both be there. of Saturn with two of the moons. Ah. For image processing, I think. <laughs> visualizations in a sort of living report. I'm going to talk about a few things here. So the very basics we'll go over because I would like to see uh, some more people using Markdown to do presentations and reports. Uh, when we first started with this, I showed the basics of a presentation that it can be output as HTML. What I've been doing lately is uh, making my reports in, or my presentations as I.O. slides and uh, has been working reasonably well, saving the output as HTML, and then you can post it to a website. So it's actually fairly portable and easy that way. Um, the easy way to do that in our studio is to just do a new file, and if you do Markdown, here it is. You can do a document or a presentation. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so for a presentation, you have two options for HTML. Um, and you can do a PDF with Beaver. Now, this requires LaTeX uh, to be installed on, on your local machine or the machine that this is processing. Uh, HTML doesn't require anything external, so we started off with that. But today, we're going to just do documents, and we're going to do some of the basics, um, but we are going to do PDF output. Since we've just been talking about LaTeX, uh, I want to take advantage of that capability. So then the output of this will be more of just a stream report, not limited to the uh, aspect ratio of slides. Okay, so it makes a nice little format for you um, and gives you some number of things that you can easily see, particularly the R code chunks, um, but I'm going to just walk through various other aspects of how one would like to structure a report. Uh, this is saved in the Google Drive, and this is the ultimate output. It's the same 
thing that I just made, except has a lot more in it. And what I'm basically just walking through is um, is this. If you just Google Markdown Basics from uh, our studio, it just rolls through a, a number of uh, the most used formatting issues and questions that uh, a lot of people use in, to make their reports look look nice and to be structured. Um, most of it is the same for for presentations as for reports, uh, as for a document. The uh, nice thing about this, it doesn't have everything in it, uh, and in particular, you, uh, I don't like the way it handles images, so I've changed a little bit of that, but it's essentially HTML. So if you know how to code in HTML, it is totally 100% compatible with HTML. So I like adding images and moving them around on the page according to HTML code, which you can just type in natively. So, for example, if you want to change the look of something and put it in italics or boldface, um, it's you surround the text with a single asterisk, or actually, or a single underscore. Both will work. And with boldface, it's double. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at that. So I do knit. Oh, and a word on packages. So you need, you need knitter, and you need the markdown packages that tend to be uh, installed in our studio. So this is some of the code and the chunks that it had. Um, and where was that? Bold, there's a bold. Ah, bold, italics, bold face. Embedding plots. So everybody does visualization of their data, embedding the, the visualization directly into the report. A very nice thing to do. Now it becomes a living document. Um, and this is just an R plot showed with um, an R code chunk. We take a look at what that is, there are a few things to note about it. Um, this is the command set for making an R code chunk. It's three little back ticks, and then this command set to format the, the chunk, three back ticks to uh, finish it off. And you need to notice here one of them is, well, one of them is R, so I'll get it to really be processing R. Uh, echo equals false. That means it will not print a local echo of the commands. Uh, I could turn that to true, and it will print the local echo. Uh, but there's a couple other ones that might be nice, and this is one that I like a lot, especially if you're doing a uh, presentation, just to align it in the center. You could change the size um, if you know you're making a, a um, Making an image, you want to put it in certain places, you can move it around, you can change the size of it, big line down, height equals four. And uh, so it says, note that echo equals false, the parameters added into the code to prevent printing of the R code, we just altered that. And if I were to run this again, it, it, it echoed the command. you might want bullets. Uh, if, in order to make bullets, you use an asterisk. Uh, you can also use a dash, but the asterisk allows you to have sub bullets, and sub bullets are with a plus sign. The thing that I want to make note of is it will not work if there's no space between this little asterisk and the command, or and the, the text. Um, the same is true with the sub bullet. And the sub bullet needs two tabs. Boom, boom. So, or that it also won't work. It will make it look like a uh, top level bullet, which is sort of strange that way. But this is sort of like Python with that. Yep, that way it counts the spaces. <laughs> so, these are the little things that you, you want to make sure of. And just like any other code, it helps to just run a bunch and make sure it looks the way you want. And once you have the 
this sort of structure. So you do it for a report, and then as time goes on and say more data or more uh, or, or more sophisticated visualizations come online, you don't have to reproduce anything. You can just hit the, the knit button and it will generate. Um, now, a nice thing is, the, is to embed R code in line, uh, and that's just a single back tip with R, and then a single back tip in the end. Uh, this will embed. So as you're writing, this is a very nicely nice thing that's a, that's very powerful as one's writing um, to have variables in their uh, typesetting text. I'm going to get more of that in a minute. Um, links, because it's a simply it's a simply HTML. Uh, links just are written in as they are, and you can make different uh, link text if you like. Which is here. You can do block quotes, and you can do block quote code with just the three back ticks surrounding your your text. It's uh, displayed verbatim, um, so it's it looks as if it's code being specified, but it's not executed. It's just for the presentation. Uh, you want to see what I'm talking about with those things? And back ticks are not apostrophes. That's right. So that's the, that's the little key with the tilde. And here's my link, block quotes. Here is my block quote code. Um, I can also add embed inline LaTeX equations. So math type equations, or math uh, in, in uh, LaTeX, it's a math environment. Uh, and that's with dollar signs. To display an equation in the center is double dollar sign. I'll show that in a second. The only unfortunate thing about it, it does not automatically index and label the equations as LaTeX does. Um, if you want a horizontal break, you can do three asterisks. But you can see here's my, my LaTeX math environment. horizontal rule page break, you can do three or more asterisks or dashes. Tables. Tables here end up looking much like tables in, uh, in LaTeX. They're formatted actually to be just like tables in LaTeX. However, much, much easier to deal with uh, if you don't mind this format. And again, the spaces here are actually pretty important in where you put the pipe and where you put the dashes. And if I were to start typing here, it actually will not process this as a table anymore. As you can see here. So, that's, a, that's not a thing. It really wants this to be a standalone mm -hmm. area where it can clearly define what the edges of the table are. Yeah, a couple other basic things. Superscripts. Um, it's you know, superscripts and subscripts are, are done so often that they're just right embedded right in there. A uh, simple up carrot surrounding whatever you want subs a superscripted or subscripted for a the subscripts will be replacing the up carrot with an underscore um, and strike through which is fun strike through is just a double tilde surrounding the text to be struck through and here's one that I've all, always liked for a long time is to add comments into code so that say whoever it has access to the source code communicate with them directly, but then if you hand a compiled version to somebody for a final report, that's not in there. It's just it's commented out of the, uh, of the markdown. So these are tools in which you start, can, start getting the ability to build um, documents that you like and that look the way you, you want. Now, of course, a big one is graphics. Not everything is going to be done with R. There's going to be graphics that can be built and, and brought in from external sources, in, 
including local uh, local places. Using HTML, I think it's the best way. I'm just doing slash image, uh, IMG. You can point to a local location of the image that you want, and you can use HTML commands to size it, center it, do whatever you want. Um, but it's very uh, pretty basic to also just grab something from the uh, from the internet. Also, so another thing that I'll do is um, on occasion if I'm pulling in a bunch of different uh, uh, graphics and images from different sources, just put them onto my local web service and just pull them out from there. What does that look like? So I'm going to go out and grab this image from this location. Couldn't find sweep to enter. Yeah, show that in a second. There's my image. One second. So, that's a few basics of Markdown. Now, what you might want to do is, now that we've got exposure to LaTeX, it is possible to have a complete LaTeX document and in the form of a manuscript that's very advanced and includes all of the graphics uh, from R embedded as code chunks in a document, and that's uh, using Sweeve, for example. Uh, Sweeve has been, I think, mostly deprecated by now, and you can use Knitter instead. So this isn't strictly a Markdown, um, uh, a Markdown file. In fact, it has a different extension, .rnw, and I'm going to show a quick test of that. Um, but this is now building upon the real capabilities of these open source sys tools um, where you're using R and LaTeX and Markdown and just is all being combined in this um, sweep document. Now, in order to do that, it's also built right in here. You can do uh, a new file and you can do R speed instead. And that's going to bring this up, which looks just like LaTeX. And you can start typing it. It will just generate a LaTeX document. It will, just by doing compile PDF, it will compile. And it will, it will make a tech, a .tex file, that can be compiled separately. Or it will just generate the PDF right through RStudio. You learn a few lessons doing this. You learn that Tech Studio, for example, is doing a whole lot of things behind the scenes. <laughs> that our studio does not do. So you will need things like the class files in the local local uh, uh, folder uh, to the document. I'm not going to do all of that right now, but there are, um, there are other uh, documents that are doing this, for example. There, this is um, a, a LaTeX document that has all of these things here and all the very typical um, LaTeX headers, but there's a few things here. This is designed for Sweep. We're not going to use Sweep. Uh, so this would generate, if I was using Sweep, it would just generate an output. And the way to, I could do Sweep to Knitter um, as a command in the Knitter package. It will just reformat this. But the easiest, the easier thing to do, in my opinion, is you comment out Sweep options and you reset concordance. Yes. Now look, these are the things I have in this document, is um, I can call a library. This is my R code chunk here, and it's got a slightly different format. Um, but I have two bras and kets surrounding and include, and the at sign marking the end of the code chunk. Uh, and this is going to be executed in R. And then the rest of it is the document are uh, generated by R. And again, I have header information to allow me to set the height and width. So if we just run through this, there are also uh, ways of having inline R code so that I can, uh, I can have my variables called right in, the, right in line in the, in the text, which is very powerful. If you ever think about it, when you're just writing something, 
using a word processor, for example, and every time you put in the date, and then someone sends it back to you and says, okay, well, uh, I've got edits on this, and then you you change the date, well, you know, Word does that automatically, but then what about some value? And you quote a value in your abstract, and then you, you know, you calculate it in your body, and then you describe it again in your conclusions. And you're editing this document, and you realize you made a small mistake, and that value is something different. Now you have to change it in three, three or four places, for example. If you just defined it as a variable, then it will, when you wrote your code, and as you updated your code, you just, your document will update automatically. This is my speed, for example, and I have here my echo is on. You would generally do that, but here's the plot. This plot was not in, was not being called, it was being generated. Here are more, I can make two columns, make them look just like anything in R would do. Uh, there is, uh, oh, this is nice, X table, where my I can, data frame in R can just be exported as a LaTeX table. Yes, very, very handy. And I can change the way some of these things look to uh, you know, customize my table. All of this is contained in the document, also in our uh, Tea Time Google Drive. So your embedding now a living document can see with LaTeX, which is very, very cool. What other things can this be used for? Uh, so I have recently did an entire manuscript in, in speed um, and in knitter and it, it worked very well. It generates the LaTeX. I can submit the, the .tdf file to my to the journal and everything's good and fine. But you're not using speed? You, you it, for me it was easiest to just use RStudio, make a speed file, write it down and then just say you know, just edit then it as I want, and then say record it was false, and then it knits. And go through knitter. Right. So, you, so even if sweep went away, you could use the syntax. Correct. And it processes in a modern library. Correct, yeah. Uh, you can do the same thing. So I've been using, uh, I've been doing a lot with Gantt charts. And we'll make Gantt charts for our projects. There's a very nice package in LaTeX called PGF Gantt that I really like using. And it is, uh, this is an example, it makes, we'll just make a document and we can say begin Gantt chart and we've got all these commands with which to draw a Gantt chart for project management. As you can see, there's a whole lot of things that are hard coded and one could predictably make linkages that are soft and controllable by R variables. But for example, for, um, let's see, where is it? I don't think I have progress bars. No, if I do, I can set progress bars on my Gantt chart bar. Progress tells me how much of that task has been completed. So I can certainly make that an R variable. And then this becomes, again, a living Gantt chart that I use for um, project management. And that would work in any markdown or right. One of the things I have I haven't had much success doing, see so there's my Gantt bar, 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of the things I have not had a lot of success doing is embedding a lot of LaTeX code in a markdown file, which is why I like going the other way. Um, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm doing anything like this or if I'm doing any kind of real report or manuscript, I'm going to stick with something like Speed that will process everything, make the, uh, and, and through Knitter, process everything, develop my tech for me, run the tech and just give me a PDF output. Um, or I could pull it into Tech Studio if I wanted to take advantage of those uh, capabilities. 
Um, so that is, in a nutshell, uh, what, I, what I think was a very nice and, and useful mm -hmm. capabilities of the RStudio documentation. It's also uh, one of the things I just did for my short course. I gave this short course last week. I did the entire thing in uh, IO slides using Markdown. I even generated data for uh, simulated data for plots for educational purposes. And then I had code in there. I turned Evil equal false for the presentation. Then if you go back to the R Studio, if we go back to this RMD, for example, and you can see what the output here is, PDF document. And I could just also just make it output HTML slides, for example, as long as I comment this out, I wouldn't want conflicting outputs. slides, I uncommented PDF document, I changed all of the echoes back to true, and then I was able to hand out a report for everybody mm -hmm. where they could just literally see all the source code and follow along with something that, again, isn't limited by the presentation aspect ratio, where you don't end up with trying to print two, three slides on a piece of paper that's barely readable. This was something, and it, it took me almost no time to make that transition and, and you know help people learn. Um, so any questions? This is where mm -hmm. I'll stop. Do you have a browser? Does anyone know where Markdown comes from and what historical background we should know? From if you go Aaron to Schwartz. and from Aaron Schwartz, if you go to uh, Daring Fireball, I sent it to you uh, uh, Hangouts message if it was there. Sure. I think it's always useful to pay attention to where things come from. So this John Gruber guy, and this is an article from 2004 where they just decided they wanted to come up with a simplified, fast way to do markdown. If you roll down to the bottom, it really was Aaron Schwartz's thing. It's at the way bottom of the page. And of course, Aaron Schwartz is no longer with us, and, uh, but he basically started out doing this. Then it's migrated along, and this is the original thing from 2004. And if you go back up to the top, there's a dingus, which is over on the right, the top there, which is a little system they built back in 2004 to try Markdown and see how to do it and all this, and just show how easy it all was. So there's some nostalgia for the old folks. <laughs> Or maybe for the new folks. And Eric Schwartz also was instrumental in doing RSS. Which is yes, probably RSS speed. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Cool.